The Holy Gospel According to John Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither in the, on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? The Gospel of the Lord. Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. Early last week, I found myself reciting one of our family's most important mottos to Sebastian our youngest, who will be six on Tuesday. We can handle anything, as long as it's the truth, I reminded him as he held my hands in the dining room, looking up at me with his huge, soft, searching brown eyes. We can handle anything, as long as it's the truth. So I'm gonna ask you again, bud. Were you watching YouTube videos of tornadoes when you were supposed to be paying attention to Miss Coiler on Zoom. <laughs> Poor buddy, we live in Oak Park where schools have been fully remote since the beginning of the school year and will remain so for the foreseeable future. If you too have kids doing Zoom school from home, you know that it's hard. And if you happen to have a kindergartner who is doing Zoom school from home, you know that it's basically a circus. Sebastian does okay in the mornings, but by his 11.15 lunch and recess hour, he is so stir-crazy that the poor kid can hardly stand himself. One afternoon, we moved him from his little desk table in the dining room into the big rocking chair in his bedroom in the hopes to give him a bit of a change of scenery and try to help him stay engaged. Well, when I took a break from work stuff to go in and check on him, the lightning quick speed with which he was adjusting the screen on his iPad combined with the guilty look in his eyes that he is too young to have figured out how to hide yet, were dead giveaways. Thus began the conversation. We can handle anything, as long as it's the truth. Were you watching YouTube videos when you were supposed to be in class? 
I could see the gears turning in his little mind as he weighed the potential consequences of YouTube indulgence against the consequences of intentionally lying to his mama. Bless the childhood innocence that actually led him to name this problem out loud. But mommy, what will happen if I tell you the truth? Sebastian gave me permission to tell you this story, but only if I promised to also tell you the truth, which is that he came clean with me that day, and he hasn't done any clandestine videoing on YouTube since then. But I share this story because it rings so true to me, even as a grown-up. When push comes to shove, we all carry some kind of worry over a version of this question, don't we? What will happen if I tell the truth? Most of us who have walked upon this earth for more than Sebastian's six years have accumulated piles of poor decisions. We've collected our fair share of unhealthy relationships, be they with friends or with family or with romantic partners. We've said and done things that we're so ashamed of that we would be horrified if they ever came to light. And so we invest a ton of energy into keeping our shame tucked away in the deepest corners of our hearts and minds terrified of what might, come, what might come unraveled if we dared to tell the whole truth about our busted up lives. The Samaritan woman at the well is no stranger to shame, no stranger to the exhausting work of trying to keep the full truth of her life tucked away. To be fair, much of the shame that surrounds her story has been thrust upon her including by generations worth of misogynistic biblical interpretation that insists on casting her as a tramp. The well-known evangelical preacher and author John Piper once gave this summary of her in a sermon. She is a worldly, sensually minded, unspirited harlot from Samaria. This kind of woman-hating biblical interpretation is so tiresome but it's unfortunately still common enough that it's incumbent upon preachers like me to set the record straight. The Gospel of John tells us matter-of-factly that the woman at the well has had five husbands and that the man she lives with now is not her husband. But nowhere does the Bible even hint at the idea that she's a harlot. That kind of interpretation says much more about our culture's approach to women and to sexuality than it says about the woman at the well. I wish I didn't have to say that out loud, believe me. But there you go. The truth is that we don't know for sure why the woman has been married so many times. But I can tell you that given the patriarchal culture of first century Palestine, the least likely scenario is that she was some sort of powerful temptress who lured men into a lusty trap it's much more likely that she had been given in marriage at a young age and that men had divorced her for perceived infertility or that she had been frequently widowed and passed on in marriage to elderly relatives as custom dictated. The gospel writer tells us that the man she's living with now is not her husband, but we don't know who he is exactly either. Perhaps he's a family member who's taken her in. Or perhaps he's someone in search of a wife, or someone whose own wife died and now needs a house servant. We also don't know for sure why she had gone to draw water in the blazing heat of the noon sun rather than in the cool of the morning, which is when most of the community's women would have gathered at the well. The gospel writer doesn't give us the details, but my heart aches in empathy for her when I imagine some likely possibilities. Perhaps the other women go all mean girl on her whenever she's around, making it subtly clear that she isn't welcome because of where her life has taken her. Or maybe she herself has chosen the relative safety of social isolation, deciding that it's easier to keep to herself rather than be rejected by those around her. There's a lot we don't know about the details of the woman's circumstances. But one thing is certain, her life has not been easy. She doesn't have to ask the question, what will happen if I tell you the truth? 
because she already knows. Her life has taught her that the full truth of her life is a recipe for grief and loneliness and shame, which is why I kind of brace myself along with her as she approaches the well and realizes that someone is already sitting there. I can almost hear her taking a deep breath as she tries to go about her task unnoticed, but all her attempts at keeping a safe emotional distance are thwarted when the man at the well starts to talk to her. Talk to her? Why is he talking to her? Everything about this conversation is wrong, wrong, wrong. First of all, she is a woman, and everyone knows that speaking to a woman in public is considered to be beneath a man's dignity. Second of all, she's a Samaritan. This man is clearly Jewish, and both she and he know that Jewish people don't talk to Samaritans on account of their mixed ethnicities and their syncretistic religious beliefs. And as we've already established, this woman has had five husbands, making her a total outcast in her community. Jewish men don't talk to outcast Samaritan women in public. Jesus breaks every possible social norm in choosing to strike up a conversation here, but it turns out that Jesus cares much more about this woman than he cares about the rules. And so he says to her, simply, give me a drink. And that one little sentence becomes the gateway to a life-changing encounter with the truth. Jesus tells the woman about living waters that gush up to eternal life. But when she asks him to give her this water so that she might never be thirsty again, he doesn't just give it to her or tell her how to find it. Instead, he hauls the source of her deepest, most isolating shame out of the shadows and into the brightness of that noonday sun. Go and get your husband, he says to her, and then come back. Go and get your husband. He knows. He already knows. I think about Sebastian's question to me. What will happen if I tell you the truth? And I wonder if the woman is doing the same kind of calculating as Jesus talks about her many husbands, wondering what kind of consequence might come from having the truth about her life laid bare. My own stomach sinks with dread when I think about what it would feel like to have the things that I spend so much energy trying to hide be put right out there in the open. And I think about the ways we all try to quench our deepest thirsts with things that just don't satisfy, about how we all work so hard to keep our deepest sources of shame locked away tightly in order to protect ourselves. But here's the thing. As the woman stands there next to Jesus, she comes to learn that our human calculations make no sense in the economy of God's grace. Where she has learned to expect isolation and shame in response to the full truth of her life, Jesus shows her that newness of life starts with the truth. It starts with being fully seen, fully known, and fully loved in all of her beauty and all of her brokenness. And as she stands in the truth of her life with Jesus right there beside her, her deepest shame comes unraveled into the gushing river at her feet a river that runs deep with an endless flow of mercy and healing, a river whose waters taste exactly like salvation. Friends, as we celebrate the Feast of All Saints today, I join you in giving thanks for all those you hold dear who have now found their final rest in Jesus. And I invite you to join me in giving thanks for this sister saint, this unnamed woman at the well, whose story points us to the salvation that comes from being fully seen 
and fully known and fully forgiven in Jesus. There is no story, no fear, no deed, no shame, no woundedness that is beyond the saving waters of Christ's gentle love. Thanks be to God.